Hello. Um, it's nice to be here. I think I need one of these for my house, so my family listens to me a little bit more authoritatively. Um, when I think about a sense of place, I think about food, and I think about food a lot. Um, how many people think about food? Quite, probably more than they really want to admit. Um, well, and, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about food, and one of my favorite things, walking through uh, people's farms and seeing their land through the eyes of a farmer. And I've even written a few books about food. Um, one that I want to talk about today is Farming with the Wild. And, and to uh, give a little background on this, I would like to do some time travel. Uh, what were the ancients thinking when they created such beautiful images in Lascaux? Uh, I mean, it, they were hunter-gatherers, they had fire and sharp objects as their basic technologies, and they were living in this, in this world of the wild and the creatureliness was all around them. And what you see here in this image are the lineage of the wild animals and the domesticated animals that we know of today. Notice that um, there are no vegetables. Um, now, domestication comes out of the wild as humans increase in population and prey becomes more scarce, agriculture becomes um, the dominant way, at least in the Western world, of trying to survive. And, ag and, and uh, domestication is, is the process of local adaptation. And you can imagine the best among us making these very careful selections over thousands of years, over the rise and fall of civilizations, breeding plants and animals, um, because our survival depends on that. And to give you a sense of the continuum of how much time this took, the, the, the Asian jungle fowl, the chicken, the ancient chicken from which our modern hens have descended, laid 17 eggs per year. Today's modern hen, lays 300 eggs per year. Now, if we go, if we fast forward up into the late 19th century, we see that this, this, these agricultural systems that we developed in Europe and in the West um, are, are transforming the native vegetation literally around the globe. And the greatest assemblage of herbivores on the planet, the North American bison, nearly 70 million bison, have been all but exterminated. And those wild animals, those big, wide-ranging mammals that do survive, they go farther and farther into these uninhabited reaches that are unsuitable for agriculture. A hundred years later, we are now applying all that we've learned in industrialization and, and economics of efficiency to agriculture, so much so that we turn watersheds into pipe sheds. And so this is a river system that has been totally channeled for the, the production of just a very few crops. And farmers have such power at their fingertips now, such technologies that, that so few of us are needed to, uh, to uh, cultivate hundreds and hundreds of acres of land, and you can just ask yourself, where is this place, right? And this happens to be in California, uh, uh, being prepared for tomatoes, but it could be in Iowa, or it could be in Missouri, or some other uh, state, easily enough. And the creatureliness of our farm really begins to disappear when we take the animals off the farm and we, put, we urbanize them in these huge feedlots and windowless barns. Um, and, and we begin to feel, wow, we've been so productive at producing food, and yet um, it's coming at quite a cost, a cost to our soils and to um, our water systems and the endangerment and extinction of species. Now, for many, many years, though, for, for decades, in fact, people have been arguing uh, about a different way for agriculture that it doesn't have to industrialize. Aldo Leopold, one of our great ecological philosophers, called for um, a revolution, a land ethic that was based partly on biotic farming. And he said a good farm is where the native flora and fauna lose acreage without losing existence. The Prince of Wales has most recently called for a future of food that's based on sustainable agriculture. And he defines this as 
agriculture that does not exceed the carrying capacity of the local e ecosystem, and it recognizes the soil as the, as the planet's most vital resource. I talk about farming with the wild, and that would be farms and ranches um, that are within fully functioning ecosystems where all members are present and, and, and which are locally adapted. And we don't have to go far to find highly productive farms that are bringing the wild back into their landscape. This is John Anderson and his wife, Marsha. John is a retired vet, uh, veterinarian. And for the last 25 years, he was frustrated with the, the clean farming in, in the Sacramento Valley, which basically meant not weed-free, but vegetation-free. And for 25 years, he's been bringing all the canal banks and the roadsides and the, the, hedge ro the, the edges between fields back to life, so much so that he's, he studied the oak savanna, where, where um, the habitat where he used to farm, what it used to be, and he's brought these native ecotypes back, 50, 50 different ecotypes, dozens and dozens of species, including beaver and, and um, a number of endangered species. Now, John's, John's farm wouldn't be so impressive if it, if it was just an island in, in the Central Valley in, in, in um, industrial agriculture, but people started to look at what he was doing and see the value in it, and it, and it has really transformed and, uh, Yolo County and the vision of what Yolo County wants to become with linked waterways and habitat from the rolling hills up into the coast range. And you can compare that to the average Central Valley agriculture, which is highly productive, but you have to say, which farming system better suits the land? And it's not just for wild creatures that we want to bring wildness into farms. Not far from John's farm, UC Davis researchers have found that the presence of wild bumblebees actually makes honeybees more productive. So there's this creative synergy, this competitive synergy, where the, the, the wild bees make the domesticated bees, which are fragile and which we depend on, better, better pollinators. We even have now farms which are self-pollinating. That is, they have enough nectar and pollen sources within the farm and around the farm that they don't even need to bring in domestic pollinators, which are responsible for one out of every three bites of food. Um, we've been learning a lot about grazing systems, information-based grazing systems from pasture-based farmers around the country. This is Art Tiki. He was a race car driver who went back to the farm and became a dairy farmer um, in southern Wisconsin. And for 20 years, Art has been managing pastures um, with no herbicides or, or synthetic fertilizers where water is completely filtrated, there's no erosion, and he's actually capturing soil, uh, so carbon from the atmosphere. And you can, again, compare it to his neighbor's farm in these very fragile, thin soils of, of southern Wisconsin and say, which farming system actually seems to fit um, the land? The one where we're feeding grain to animals that aren't even adapted to eating corn or the ones where, where we have um, permanent ground cover and habitat. Um, Pete Kanegi farms in southern Oregon, and he has a different challenge. He has a slough which rims his, his family's 500-acre um, farm, and they need to keep this in production, but they also want the slough to be able to flood, to, to be a river when it wants to be a river. And you can see that they have a generous, uh, canop they have a generous forest along that slough, a riparian edge about 75 feet wide, and it has varying structures of, of plants. But they've adapted a cropping system where they can either have a cover crop that overwinters, it can stay wet, and then um, he, can, he can plow into that, um, late in the season, or they can even grow a winter wheat crop. And if we go inside, sorry, if we go inside that riparian area, we can see that he even has uh, a native grass seed crop and a long-term walnut veneer forest um, that's growing within his riparian zone. Um, a good farm and, and a good farmer, you know that because you can feel the sense of place before any words are spoken or any ideas are exchanged. Um, when I think back to my first question, what were they thinking? What were the ancients telling us? I think they were saying that we 
we are wild and we are of the wild and in the wild is our salvation. So um, I I'm just ask you whenever we can in our tables, in our homes, in our hearts, let's uh, keep it wild. Thank you.